try to take advantage of the government by not stating, you know, if they if they have a, if a requirement's been written sort of nebulously, they don't ask a question about it. They wait till contract award and then they say, oh, well, that I didn't know that's what you expected, and then they try to get more money out of the government by doing that. There's a picture we use with the admirals and generals, which is a tugboat, and it's next to a large um, cruise ship. And the tugboat is called the original contract, and the cruise ship is called contract modifications. <laughs> Meaning that they try to get, you know, they come in with a low, really low ball price, and then they, so that's a, that's a, um, an ethical business practice, but there are companies out there that practice it. So mutually, a mutual assent means that both parties understand it. Um, and this is why uh, contracts can be challenged if you enter into them with a mentally incompetent person or uh, a child because they are not legally competent in the eyes of the law. Um, a contract is a promise for the breach of which the law provides a remedy. So after you enter into this contract, if you break it, which is what a breach is, um, the law gives you a way of getting it fixed. So if you and your friend said, um, let's go to the movies on Friday, and he or she backs out of the movies on Friday, there's no contract there, right? There's no legal, there's nothing in law that forces that person to go to the movies with you. But if you had a contract, then you would have a remedy. Or the performance of which the law recognizes as a duty. So when I enter into a contract with you, I have a duty to perform my part of it, and you have a duty to perform your part of it. That's what we've agreed to in the contract, because we both signed it and both voted it. It's a transaction involving two or more individuals um, or two entities where your son, where an authorized person on behalf of your company is signing on behalf of their company. Where two or more individuals where, uh, whereby each has reciprocal rights, so we're both doing something, to demand performance of what is promised. So as long as I'm doing everything on my end to uphold the contract, I can hold your feet to the fire. As long as you're doing everything on your end, you can hold my feet to the fire. Um, a promise is a declaration of one's intention to do something or to not do something. So, um, you know, uh, I'm going to donate this property to you, but I'm saying that it has to be used for um, child development services. It can't be used for prostitution. You know. It's something that I'm saying it has it, it, you must use it for, and something else that you're, you have to refrain from using it for. So if an individual promises in a contract to do something, the courts will ensure that he or she upholds the promise. If he or she does not, the courts will provide a solution for the person for whom he or she made the promise. So if you default, I can go to the courts, and the courts can tell you you have to uphold your end of the deal. Any questions about just basic language? Okay. So all that, everything we're talking about applies in the government space, and we'll talk about nuances. Now keep in mind, contract law is, forms the basis for the Uniform Commercial Code, which is what you do today with your commercial companies. You're governed by the Uniform Commercial Code. It also governs what you'll do in the future when you're a prime contractor to the federal government, because you'll be following the federal acquisition regulations. Um, there's... Uh, Unilateral and bilateral. So in unilateral, it means that only one party makes a promise. So if a purchase order under a simplified acquisition procedure is signed by a contracting officer and, in, and given to you, that's a unilateral move. That's a unilateral contract. Um, the, you also hear this term when it comes to modification. So now let's say we have a contract in place, a baseline contract, and the government um, now has requirements for using green technology in buildings. Um, in that case, the government could say, we're going to impose a green requirement on you, and you are required to do... Green is, that has a lot of dollars associated with it. I'm trying to think of something that... Um, you know, they might say that you have to comply with some new regulation, and there's no real dollar impact to you, you just have to do it. In that case, the government can unilaterally state that you have to do that, and you would have to do it. In cases like the green technology I just talked about, in that case, there would be dollars associated with that 
implementing that green technology. And in that case, the government would issue what they call a bilateral mm -hmm. modification. So they're telling you what change to the contract is occurring, and you need to come back with your proposal, it gets negotiated, and then it gets added to the contract. So both parties are involved in the decision. In a unilateral, only the government's involved in the decision. Unenforceable is a um, contract that cannot be enforced by the courts because of the particular statute of doctrine. So unenforceable contracts are not invalid, but if a breach of an unenforceable contract occurs, then the courts cannot determine if a remedy exists. Um, an example is if you enter into, okay, so one of the rules is that if you're gonna sell land, any kind of real estate, you have to have a written contract. But let's say, you know, you've known your buddy for years and you say, hey, you know, you want this parcel of land, I'm gonna charge you $50,000 for it, you guys do a handshake agreement, and it's an oral contract. That is unenforceable by the courts because by law, by statute, the uh, sale of real estate has to be done through written means. So this becomes important because the contracting officer representative, the person that you're gonna be dealing with most of the time, has no authority to change the contract. So let's say, for example, um, I was supposed to paint this room this beigey color, and I did that. And Stephanie's my, my core, my contracting officer representative. And uh, she said, yeah, Mary, you know, this looks nice, but you know, now that I'm sitting in class, it would really be nice if it was like sort of a spa green, because I think that would just open up for everybody's senses to learning, and we'd be all in a better place, and it matches much better with my melon. Uh, pineapple, and, uh, <laughs> fruit salad, hand lotion. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I say to myself, oh, well, you know, Stephanie's the only person in the government I deal with on a day to day, day basis. I mean, she's telling me she wants spa green. You know, I should do it. So tonight I bring in all my printers, my, printers, my painters, and we repaint this room spa green. And she comes into the bar and she's like, what? What, what, what happened here? Well, Stephanie, you mentioned that you like this spa green lotion, and I, you know, but I impress you and I go ahead and do it. Marianne, I don't have any authority to verbally tell you to change the contract. And see, that would be my bad, right? Because in her position as core, she has no ability to change the contract. Even though it seems like, from my point of view, apparently she seems like she's an authority. She's the one giving me all my direction. But the only thing she can give me direction on is my existing statement of work. She can't make any changes to it. The only person that can change is the contracting officer. So that's how that. So, so if the change comes down, would she not be the one that lets you know that there's a change? So what would happen is, if the government is necessitating the change, then the contracting officer would contact my contracting officer and say. Here's the change to the contract, and they could either do it unilaterally or bilaterally. And then, um, if you have any questions, your program manager, Marianne, can ask Stephanie. Um, avoidable contract is one in which one of the parties is bound to the terms of the contract, while the other may withdraw from the contract at any time. So, um, contracts with persons under the legal age and contracts induced by fraud such as uh, ones containing intentional misrepresentation of the facts. Those become voidable contracts. So, um, you know, if, if somebody says, if we were just talking about mining, and um, if I tell you that there's coal underneath, you know, in my, on my property, and uh, you buy my property because you, I told you that, it becomes a voidable contract if you start using your high-powered equipment that you're refurbishing over there, 30 a clip, um, that you would, that would be a voidable contract because I misrepresented the facts. There, there is no coal on my property, so that would be an example of that. A void contract is one that never became a contract because it lacked the essential elements of an agreement. Um, so in either of these situations, a voidable contract or a voided contract, the contracting officer can void the contract. So the, under the first one, they can um, void it under, voidable is under the Christian doctrine. So the government always has to reserve the right to get out of a contract with you. Even if they have it in place, you've negotiated it, you've been running it, you're doing fine, they still have the right to get out of the contract. 
they have it, you don't have it. Because they, it's sovereign immunity. They're acting as the government and they have sovereign immunities. And, and there are times where, for the convenience of the government, it makes sense for them not to, to continue on with it. Um, and a valid contract, last but not least, has all the right elements and um, is ready to go. So here are the, all the elements. So an offer is a promise of what will be done and what is expected if the promise is fulfilled. So initiate, to initiate a contract, you have to make an offer. So advertisements are not considered to be offers, but rather invitations to negotiate when they are very specific regarding offer and acceptance of terms. So you know um, mattress, mattress discounters from one low, low price. You know, so you hear that, but you don't think of that as a binding contract. But if they say, um, if you come in between now and 12 or 1159 uh, Friday night, you can get uh, a certain mattress, this model number, this uh, color, uh, this size, for this price, that's going to be an offer. Notice the level of specificity and detail. Um, an offer must show the offer's intent to perform if the offer is accepted by the, uh, by the, accepted by the other party. So when the government says, this is what we want, and this is what I'm going to if, if if the government puts out the requirements and I come back with an offer to those requirements and they accept it, we're in a contract. It has to be completed and clear of all its terms, meaning all the terms and conditions that you state in there have to be complied with. And it must be communicated to the offeree so that they've told me they're accepting my, my uh, offer. Acceptance, so after there's an offer, there has to be an acceptance. An acceptance is an expression of a consent to a proposal or offer. So when I, when the government issues their RFP and I issue an offer to that RFP and they come back with acceptance, they've signed on the bottom line, we now have a contract. There's two ways to accept a contract, uh, to accept an offer. The first is if it's unilateral, the acceptance occurs when the offeree delivers or performs. Um, so if the government starts issuing these task orders, that will be they accepted it. If the contract is bilateral, it occurs when the offer expresses acceptance to the terms and conditions of the offer. So the government, so if I, if the government said, here's the RFP, I come back with my offer, they've accepted it. If I say I'm taking exceptions to these certain terms and conditions and they accept it, that means they've accepted those changes to terms and conditions. Any questions so far? Acceptance has to be expressed by the offer. It has to be consistent with the same terms and conditions stated in the offer. So if, the, if I say to the government, I'm going to do exactly everything you said, and the government comes back, and when they sign on the dotted line, they have added three new requirements, that's a disconnect, right? That's not acceptance, because they have altered terms and conditions of the original contract. Changing the terms or conditions creates a counteroffer. So if any of you involved, have you ever bought a house, condo, mm -hmm. piece of property, right? So uh, oftentimes if you purchased it, you submitted, they, the, the um, buyer, I'm sorry, the seller had an asking price and you came back with either you met their asking price or you came in lower than their asking price and then maybe they offered a counter. That's the process we're talking about here. Um, when you, when you change the, okay, so we'll talk about, and then it has to be timely. So the offer may stipulate a period of time for which the um, offer is no longer valid. So normally when we submit our proposals, remember when we talked about, uh, I mentioned cover letters. Any kind of transmittal letters, you typically say in a transmittal letter that this proposal to the government is valid for some period of time, and usually 60 days. And the reason why you're saying that, and, and, and you're also putting that, you want your subcontractors to say that to you, so that you have current pricing for 60 days. If the government waits till day 61, you have every right to go back and give them different prices. Now you may choose to just extend the original offer and say, that we would just like to extend the original validity date through um, six months. 
or you can decide to put in another option. In other words, you're only held to the terms and conditions and pricing and solution of that proposal that you submitted through your validity date. Mutual consideration means that each party receives something of value and gives up something of value when the contract is established between the two parties. So I mentioned this fellow ventures thing that we're doing. So we're, um, we're a group of executives and we understand, because we've all started up companies and sold them and that kind of thing, that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have great ideas, but they never are able to get it through to fruition because they, they, they're like either the ideas person and they don't have the implementation skills or they're the um, person who really likes to do technology. They're all about IT, but they don't know how to run a business. You know, so basically they have one core skill set, but they don't need the rest of the skill sets to run a business. So we'll come in and we'll run your business for you. And in exchange, you give us 10% of the business. So notice how that's a mutual consideration. We're going to give you our expertise and you know hundreds of years of experience in running businesses. You're going to give us 10% of your business. So that's mutual consideration. Legal purchase. And this is what um, the movie was a little questionable about yesterday. Um, if, the, if the DOD knew that there was a worldwide shortage of, am of US ammunition, and contracted for U.S. ammunition, how were the contractors expected to go out and get that ammunition? So, you know, the, there's a questionable nature to that movie about the legal nature of that contract. So the legal purpose has, to, the contract has to be made for a legal pur purpose. If the contract violates a statute, it is unlawful and void. So if I contract, um, you know, when you, read all these movies, or see all these movies, or read these books, right? Somebody's contracted an assassin. That's a, that's a, against a legal purpose, right? Violates the statutes. Contractual capacity, the two parties that are entering into the contract have to have um, capacity. And what they're talking about here is um, the ability to incur legal uh, uh, liability and acquire legal rights. So, you know, a four-year-old can't enter into a contract. They don't have the legal capacity. They don't, they can't have a meeting of minds with you because, you know, they're still working with language, trying to understand it. So that's an example of capacity. So, or if, if we go out tonight and we've both been drinking and, and I decide to sell you my car, right, you could go back and say well, that would be an example where I was intoxicated and I didn't have the contractual capacity to enter into that contract. Okay, agency and authority. So agency is a fiduciary responsibility based on trust and confidence between two persons in which one person acts for or represents the principal in dealing with third parties. So let's say, for example, you're going through a real estate transaction. And or, uh, so I bought my beach house for my sister and her husband. And at the time of when we actually conducted the transaction, they had to be out of the country. So they sent a legal represent representative to the closing, and uh, the person had legal had documentation to say that they were representing my sister. So that my sister and her husband gave them agency so that they could act on Lorian's behalf in this real estate transaction. <coughs> Obviously, they felt comfortable doing that because they're dealing with me, you know, family type thing. So you have to be very careful of who you give agency to. But that's an ability that you have when you can't fulfill the, the particular requirements of the contract. You can uh, base it on a fiduciary responsibility to give the responsibility to somebody else to represent you. A principal can confer, can confer authority on an agent only if the agent accepts it. So. Um, you know, Lori and Steve couldn't say, oh, we're, we're going off to Europe and Susie's going to be our agent if Susie doesn't come back and say, I accept that responsibility. Because if Susie made any mistake, Lori and Steve would have legal ramifications against her if she acted outside of her, out of the agent agreement. Now where this comes into play is when you're, um, 
a contracting officer. In the government, a contracting officer has a certain warrant 